Well, we are going to start a new sermon series today on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and it's providential that this opening passage in Mark speaks to the subject of baptism. So as we celebrate the baptism of Brett and Sarah's son, at the same time, God is inviting us to consider and to celebrate the baptism of his son, Jesus Christ. Since we are embarking now on an extended journey into the Gospel of Mark, I thought it made sense to say just a little bit by way of background about the author, about uh, who Mark is, a little bit about the Gospel itself, because all the Gospels are different, right? Mark is not like Matthew, it's not like Luke or John, um, so a little understanding would go a long way. Mark was an eyewitness follower of Jesus Christ, but he was not one of the 12 disciples. He was probably too young at that point in his life. It would be conjecture, but he might have been 10, 12 years old, 13 perhaps. Um, but he hung around with the disciples and with all those who followed Jesus around Judea, around Galilee. According to the Bible, uh, and the references will be on the screen, Mark was a missionary associate, kind of a partner with the Apostle Paul, also uh, Barnabas, one of the other great missionary apostles, as well as the Apostle Peter. And most Bible historians believe that Mark probably received much of the content uh, for the stories that are in his Gospels through Peter, who many scholars suggest was um, related to Mark. Peter may have been Mark's uncle, he may have been a cousin, uh, but they think that there was some family relationship between Peter and Mark. Mark's Gospel is believed by most scholars to be the first of the four Gospels that was written, probably written in the late 50s, maybe early 60s A.D., uh, written when Mark was in Rome, they believe perchance he was the leader, he was the pastor of the Christian church in Rome. Now because there was persecution in Rome, you remember Nero and the other Caesars who were trying to stamp out Christianity, uh, and you know it was spreading obviously not just throughout Rome but throughout the entire Roman Empire, Christians were being horribly persecuted and martyred uh, on a regular basis for their faith in Christ. So Mark is writing to try to strengthen uh, the community of faith, not just in Rome, but uh, scattered throughout the empire, to inspire them to suffer and to serve faithfully, even unto death, their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Mark wants to encourage them, but he wants to encourage us today as well, to follow courageously, follow obediently in the footsteps of Jesus. That's probably enough by way of introduction. You can read more about that if you have a good study Bible, a life application, or some other kind of Bible that has uh, a little bit of an intro that might fill in some gaps. But let's jump into today's text. The first thing that I want us to note here this morning is the Trinity. This passage is one of the main passages in the Bible used to validate the existence of God as a triune God. That is, one God who exists in three persons. Uh, the word Trinity, you may know, doesn't actually occur anywhere in the Bible. So our understanding of God as one essence with three persons has been derived from the overall witness of Scripture from beginning to end. Uh, for example, in this story, we see Jesus the Son standing in the, the Jordan River, right? Uh, and then at the same time, we're looking at the Son, and uh, we hear the voice of the Father coming down. Can you imagine what that was like for those around? It's like, whoa, what's this? You know, is that thunder? No, it's too clear. There's words. God the Father speaks from heaven, and then at the same time, the clouds, the sky is somehow torn open, it says, and, and the, the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, descends upon Jesus in the water uh, like a dove. Maybe not literally a dove. That's usually the image we use, uh, but like a dove. So there's the Trinity. Uh, so as a divine being, God is singular in one sense, but he's plural in another sense. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this today. This is obviously something that we could take quite a bit of time unpacking, trying to unpack. Uh, it deserves more treatment than what I can give it right now. 
but I will say that this whole conception of God as triune is mysterious, and it, and it defies our human reason. We, we like to think that we can figure everything out. But this is kind of like the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, it, it's beyond um, human reason and definitions. Uh, let me put a diagram up on the board that I have found helpful. Uh, of the persons in the Godhead, none of them is God without the others, and yet each of the others uh, with the others is God. Uh, so they're distinct persons, and yet they're not separate persons. Uh, kind of hard to grasp, isn't it? I, I like the way, I think it was a Christian chemist or a scientist described it years ago. You've perhaps heard this before. There's a lot of different analogies that get used. Uh, but it's like water in its three different forms. We have liquid water, uh, like we used with the baptism this morning. But then we have frozen water, which we're all looking forward to this January. We can go out on the lake and drop a line. Uh, and then there's uh, evaporating water. There's steam, right? So they are all, in essence, water, right? They're all H2O. Uh, but they come in three different forms, and, and they have kind of different functions as well. So it is with the persons of the Godhead, one nature and one essence, yet three distinct people. And that's why when we have the sacrament of baptism, we do it in the name of the three persons of the Trinity. That's what Jesus said, right? Matthew 28, 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the second person of the Trinity, Jesus himself says, there is a Trinity. We don't have to doubt that. We can accept that on the words of Jesus. Okay, point number two. Since we've broached the subject of baptism, let's raise the question, why did Jesus get baptized? Well, probably the quickest and the easiest answer for that is to set an example for us. If Jesus didn't think that it was important to be baptized, he wouldn't have commanded us, commanded us to be baptized. And he wouldn't have bothered to do it himself. But let's take a look at something that Jesus says in Matthew's gospel about this, in Matthew 3, 13 to 15, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, parallel account to what we read earlier. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, but now you come to me? Jesus replied, listen, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. Well, what does that mean? It means that Jesus was ready to begin the ministry, the public ministry, the mission that God gave to him, God the Father gave him to save us. That's what he's really talking about. Uh, we need to be clear that Jesus' baptism in water is different from our own, though, because Jesus, unlike us, had no sin. He was perfect. He was innocent. Never sinned. Uh, so he didn't have sins in his life that he needed to repent of or to be cleansed of, none of that. So what does this baptism represent? Well, really four things. Take a look at the screen. It represents for Jesus this, the, the moment of his decision to launch his public ministry. Secondly, the moment of his equipping by the Holy Spirit. Remember, he's just like you. He's just like me. He's a man. He's a natural man, born of a woman born under the law, born like anybody else, but he needed the equipping of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Thirdly, the moment of his approval by the Father, he heard the voice, and then lastly, the moment of identification with God's people. So those four things, I think, are part and parcel of the meaning of this event. But let's move on to the next thing that I want to pull out from this uh, narrative uh, in Mark chapter 1, uh, and look at verse 8, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see the words there. John says, I baptize you with water, but he, the one who's coming after me, of whom I'm not worthy to untie his sandals, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that. Uh, before I say anything else, though, uh, this subject, I think, is one that we many of us recognize and confess that there's been some misunderstanding, right? There's been some confusion uh, around this topic. There's, there's been hurt in some churches. Uh, there's been conflict. 
uh, there's, yeah, there's been rejection, there's been criticalness toward other Christians who don't see it the same way as we do, perhaps. Uh, and, and all of that kind of thing does not emanate from the Spirit of God, right? I mean, I think we can acknowledge that that either comes out of human ignorance or human pride or something like that. This is not a subject that should divide God's people. The Spirit comes to give us peace and joy and unity, not strife, not conflict, not some kind of spiritual apartheid or a two-class Christianity. Well, you know, I've got more of God than you do or whatever. None of that. Our goal in talking about this subject should be to understand the biblical revelation about the Spirit, to open our hearts, open our lives uh, to the working of God's Spirit, and especially uh, to love God and other believers in Jesus Christ, to be in unity and fellowship with each other. This obviously is a subject that could take many sermons. Uh, I'm not going to cover it all today. Uh, we're just going to scratch the surface, but let's, let's draw our attention to some scriptures. First of all, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. That verse says, For we were all baptized by, or the Greek preposition can be with, the Spirit, uh, one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Two important things to note there. First of all, uh, all who are, are in Christ are baptized with the Holy Spirit. All who are in Christ are baptized with the Spirit. Paul says, if you look at verse 3 of that same chapter, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And look at what Paul says in Romans 8 verse 9. If you want to jot that down, you, however, are, not, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. Very plain, very straightforward language from Paul there. So what's Paul saying? He's saying that you cannot be a true Christian, a true follower of Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Now, according to the script, uh, scripture study that I have done over the, my years of pastoring, I believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a one-time action of God by which God makes you a new person and gives you a changed heart and a changed life. Like Jesus said to Nicodemus, John chapter 3, you must be born again. So the, the key question today, and really the key question of life, is this. Have you had this experience of being born again and being made new, a new person, by the power of the Holy Spirit? Please do not confuse having uh, amounts of knowledge, head knowledge, about God with becoming a new person under the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Those are two completely different things. Remember the verse in Matthew where Jesus said, not all who call me Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven? What did Jesus mean by that? That's kind of a difficult verse. He's saying that there will be people on the day of judgment who thought that they knew Christ but they were missing it. They were really missing it because the Spirit of God had never transformed their hearts. They were never born again, born anew, born from heaven, born by the Spirit. Friend, God does not want you to miss his salvation and the joy of living under the power and the control of his heavenly Spirit. Jesus said in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, if you, though you are evil, though you are sinful, know how to give good gifts to your children, listen to this part, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So if you've never had this experience, if you can't assuredly, confidently, unequivocally say, I am born again, that verse says all you need to do is say, God, I'm asking you to give me the gift of your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me. Make me a new person. And God will do it. Jesus says he will do it. That's powerful. Let's move on. 
The second thing we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is that there's only one spirit. Now, I've used this illustration. Some of you have heard this before, uh, but I think it, it kind of makes the point effectively. Uh, when I was in high school, we used to have pep rallies. I don't know if they still do that in high schools or not, but before a home game, we would have pep rallies. We had uh, all the students come into an assembly in the gymnasium. The bleachers were pulled out on both sides. We'd have the ninth and 10th graders on one side. We had the 11th and 12th graders on the other side, and the spirit contest would begin. So I went to Shelby High School. We were the Shelby Tigers. And so the underclassmen would start screaming at the top of their lungs, we have spirit, yes we do, we have spirit, how about you? Pointing to the other side. And in response, the upperclassmen would scream at the top of their lungs, we have spirit, yes we do, we have spirit, how about you? And back and forth it would go, getting louder and louder. And the principal and some of the faculty were on a little uh, squad that would decide which team had the most spirit. And so the spirit contest would end with the Shelby Tiger mascot, some big stuffed tiger being awarded to that side until the next pep rally. Friends, there is not one kind of spirit for you and another kind of spirit for me or for somebody else. There's, there's not one spirit for the Pentecostals and then a different spirit for the Lutherans or the Reformed or the Baptist or you name it. No. One spirit. We're all given the same spirit, Paul says. You look at 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 7. There are different kinds of gifts, yes. Different manifestations, yes. But Paul says the same spirit. Different kinds of service, same Lord. Different kinds of working, same God works in all of them. And to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. So everything that God wants to do in us by the Spirit is for good. It's not to bring harm. It's not to bring division. It's not to bring misunderstanding. It's for good. The good of you, the good of the church, the good of those you're trying to love and serve. It's for good. So let me give you the four primary works, or let's say the results of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First one I've mentioned is making us born again, is receiving that gift of faith by which we're regenerated, made new in our hearts. Number two, making us holy, sanctifying us to live like Jesus. We can't do that in our own strength. We need the Spirit. Thirdly, empowering us to be Christ's witnesses. I think all of us who were involved with City Fest last weekend understand that we were doing that not in our own strength, knowledge, wisdom, effort, whatever. It was completely a moving, a motivating, and an inspiring of the Holy Spirit that got us to downtown Grand Rapids for two nights, or however many nights you were there, empowering us to be witnesses, giving us fellowship and unity with other believers is the last one. Friends, the desperate need in the world today is for believers, and I would say as, as well as for churches, that cooperate fully with the Holy Spirit in order to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, in our community, in our country, to the ends of the earth, and to build the kingdom of God on this planet. That's what we're here for. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. We can't do those things without the Spirit's help. The Old Testament prophet Zechariah has a great verse yeah, I think he said it well when he said this, not by might nor by power, he's speaking about human might, human power, human effort, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So may God help us, friends, to, to live under the leading and the powering uh, of the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, time to conclude. It is Sunday school today. I'm trying to watch the clock without letting it constrain me or quench the Holy Spirit of God, but I want to be respectful of that today. The last thing that I want us to note from our passage uh, might be the most important one of all. You look at the statement that the Father makes to Jesus in this baptism. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now notice that the Father does not say, this is my beloved son. Okay, he's not speaking to the crowd. Who's he speaking to? One person. The one who's next to John in the water, Jesus, his son, you are my beloved son, the one I love. And if you don't hear anything else that I say this morning, I want you to hear this, that God loves you personally, individually, knows your name, knows how many hairs are on your head, if you have hair on your head. 
He knows you and he loves you. And if you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ, Scripture says that you have become a son or a daughter of the living God, a child of the living God. Uh, Listen to these words from Romans chapter 8. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And daughters is interchangeable there, okay? Don't feel excluded, women. Those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Jesus Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This revelation that God gives Paul about our our standing before God as his children uh, should really blow our minds. I mean, when you think about who God is and who we are as fallen, broken, sinful people, and and God loved us before we were even born. And in fact, he loved us enough to give us life, to bring the sperm and the egg together and to conceive life in that reproductive mechanism that was an act of his divine love to bring us into existence. God loved us supremely in his son by dying for us. And Jesus still loves us every moment of every day as he sits at the right hand of the Father's throne, praying for us, loving us, watching over us. You know, I feel like we need to just stop and sing an old song right now. Put the words on the screen. If you know it, join me. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Sing it out. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So here's the question. Do you believe those words that you just sang this morning? Really believe them? What Paul teaches in that passage in Romans 8 is that the Holy Spirit shows us, reveals to us that the Father loves us as his adopted children as much as, not less than, he loves his very own son, the second person of the Trinity. Wrap your brain around that a minute. Jesus said in John 14, 21, he who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself to him. Isn't that awesome? He goes on in verse 23 to say, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him or her and we will come to him and make our home with him inside of you, home to the living God. If you're not a Christian here this morning, uh, if you've never consciously, deliberately invited Christ to come into your heart, invited the Holy Spirit of God to to come and live in your, your heart, to cleanse you of your sins, God wants you to do that. God really wants you to do that. The Bible says that God loves you, that he sent Jesus into the world to to take away your sins and to give you the gift of eternal life. And I know that God will do that for you because guess what? He did it for me. I did not deserve it. I didn't earn it. (laughs) But he did it for me, and he'll do it for you. I've met a lot of people who think that God is kind of this vengeful, angry, mean God who sits up there on his throne with his long beard and his stern face, and he's, you know, he's just looking for somebody on earth to mess up so he can squash them like a bug or whatever. And I've met a lot of other people who think, well, God could never love me. I, you know, if you knew my life and what a, you know, trashed track record I have, you know, the kind of things that I've done. How many times I've sinned against God again and again. I confess it, I do it again, I confess it, I do it again. You know, you would understand that God just can't love me. I'm beyond the reach of his love. I've gone too far. Can I I say to you that those are lies from the pit of hell? 
Satan does not want you to know and believe that God really, really, really loves you. But the Word of God says he does. The testimony of Scripture, the testimony of millions, billions of believers down through the ages is that God loves sinners. You don't have to clean yourself up in order to come to God. He'll take you as you are. None of us is worthy of God's love based on our track record. So when the Jews caught a woman, you remember this story in John's Gospel, they caught a woman in the act of adultery. It's like, okay, no, no question about this. Uh, they bring her to Jesus, and they demand that she be put to death. Uh, the, the law, the Jewish law, says she should be stoned to death. That was the penalty for that sin. So they stood around her, and they picked up rocks, maybe not as big as this one, probably more jagged rocks. Some of you have been to Israel. You know uh, they've, they've got a lot of rocks there. Uh, but they picked up rocks to stone her. Um, and Jesus said to the angry mob standing all around, ready to go, let he of you who is without sin throw the first one. And, you know, some of the older, wiser ones of the Pharisees and teachers of the law that were standing there thought about that statement. Let the one who is without sin throw the first one. Well, I'm not going to do that. I know I've got sin in my life. So eventually, what happens? They drop them, and they start to melt away into the crowd. Jesus turns to the woman, and he says, Woman, where are your accusers? Who is left to condemn you? And she says, No one, Lord. And then get these words. He says, Neither do I condemn you. You feel the power of that? I'm not going to throw a rock at you either, and I'm God. I am without sin. I don't condemn you. I love you. But then don't miss what he says next. Now go and leave your life of sin. I don't know if this morning you have felt like with the life that you've lived that there is condemnation for you from God and maybe even other people from the church, whatever. Would you just let, let that go and hear that God loves you and he does not condemn you and he's the one you've got to stand before on the final day? He says, I don't condemn you. I, I give you my love. I give you my forgiveness. So now just come to me. Leave your life of sin. Don't, don't keep doing that. I love you too much to leave you in your sin, but come to me now, receive my love, live in my love, and experience the joy of life in me. That's the Christian faith. That's why we're here, right? And that's the message that we have to tell everybody outside these doors. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your unfathomable love, your unconditional love for us, your uncondemning love. Paul says in Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But to the contrary, the, the other side of that is true, that those who, who never come to Christ, who never put trust in Christ and don't know him, as their Savior, there will one day be condemnation. There will be a judgment. And Lord, on that day, I would pray that no person here or no person who's listening to my voice um, through a, a website or through recording would miss the opportunity to come into a knowledge and into a saving relationship with you. F Father, thank you that you made that possible through Jesus, who came and lived as one of us and yet was sinless and yet gave his life on the Cal cross of Calvary in order to pay the punishment that we should have paid, but he paid it for us. And he says, if we simply believe in him and put our faith in him, that he will erase our sin, the guilt of our sin will be removed, and we will come into an eternal life. So, Lord, you are making that very invitation open to each and every one of us here right now. And if there's any person who's never responded to that invitation, uh, trusting that it's true, knowing in their heart that you are the one you said to be, you did all that you claimed to do, you did rise again from the dead, and that one day you will come back in judgment, and they will face you one day. Every eye will see, every knee will bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, draw them to yourself. Pour out your Holy Spirit, Father, upon all of us here. And for those of us who need to be renewed and rededicated and reconsecrated in our walk with you, Lord, bring that into us today as well. And thank you for your love. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to hear our prayer this morning, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.